This episode is brought to you by CBS All Access. If you don't already subscribe to CBS All Access, please use our affiliate link by going to talkthroughmedia.com slash CBS. Using our affiliate link gives us a little credit, which helps us to keep bringing you great content, U.S. residents only. And welcome to episode 50 of the Star Trek Discovery Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm Ruthie. I mean, <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. I'm not Ruthie. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm James. And I'm Ruthie. No, wait. <laughs> I'm not either. I'm LT. You're not yes. Ruthie? <laughs> Who's Ruthie? You're the, you're the Don't runner say up, that. Ruthie. <laughs> so... Anyway, uh, unfortunately, Ruthie is not uh, available tonight. Um, just so you guys know, there have been uh, a, a, like a whole bunch of ice storms that have hit the Oklahoma area, and Ruthie has been without power since Monday. So she's okay. Um, she's staying, you know, with with relatives. So you know, she, she's okay. She's going to have to throw out a whole bunch of uh, food when she gets home. But uh, her power's been out since Monday, so um, she did let me know that uh, earlier this afternoon she finally got to see the episode, but she's not really prepared um, to do an episode on it. So Kyle, who would have been my first go-to, he wasn't available this weekend. You know, it was on short notice, but I was able to get from the Walking Dead talk through our new co-host from that. LT, who you guys all know. So, with you first. And then, who's with LT, but none other than James, the augmented sailor. So, it's two to one. <laughs> so, thank you, both of you guys, for uh, being able to uh, step up on short notice. And you guys have been two of the greatest uh, supporters of the podcast, um, you know, for a long time, like since we first got the Patreon going, you guys have been supporters right from the beginning. So anyway, uh, James LT, thank you so much for being able to do this on very short notice. Uh, it's, it's great to have you. I'm glad to be here, man. Get out of the apocalypse and get into the final frontier. <laughs> yes. And, and we've, Unfortunately, had to deal with the world beyond. <laughs> <laughs> I thankfully have not been subjected to that as of yet, and hopefully will not be. Oh, come on, man. Join the party. <laughs> it's not terrible. It's just boring. <laughs> I can't even subject myself to fear anymore. So fear has been good. Um, uh, fear, fear has been, fear has been pretty good, but, but, uh, world beyond has been boring, but <laughs> I, and I, I, you know, I'm sorry if that bothers anybody to say, but it's, it's just, it, it just, it's a young adult and I, I just can't get into it. Yeah. It's, I, I feel about the, feel about the same way as that is, as Ruthie is about animation. Yeah. It's pretty equivalent to that. Okay. So anyway, um, we will be covering season three, episode three of Star Trek discovery titled people of earth. But before we start, get started with that, we have additional feedback for both the podcast and the episode known as Season 3, Episode 2, Far From Earth. So let's open hailing frequencies. Okay, so our first bit of feedback is from Bob. And Bob, I'm sorry, we're, I don't know where you're from again. I know we've said it before, but um, I don't. I don't remember right off the top of my head. So I'm just going to call you Bob from the internet. <laughs> and he says, Brian and Ruthie, this was a fantastic second episode. Not as amazing as the season opener, 
but 301 set the bar extremely high and it's quite hard, is quite the hard act to follow. With that said, Lieutenant Detmer has some awesome piloting skills that I think would have had the admiration of Sulu. There were three relationships of note to me this episode, Saru versus Giorgio, Saru and Tilly, and Stamets and Reno. The tension and power struggle between Saru and Giorgio was palpable, intense, and delicious as it slowly builds toward an inevitable confrontation. The disrespectful and narc Narcissistic response by Giorgio will have to be dealt with by Saru very soon, and definitely as her attitude is undercutting his authority and leadership with the crew. And speaking of leadership, I absolutely love the mentioning Saru gives Tilly several times throughout the episode. He recognizes her potential and works to strengthen that and her self esteem, which seems to be in a str- fragile state after Giorgio stomps on it with Leland's stained boots. <laughs> These exchanges tell me that Commander Saru should stay as captain of the Discovery. Well, hint, hint. I was less than impressed with the relationship building that, they, that the show put Stamets and Reno through. I got the impression that they were working toward a love-hate, friend-adversary, a grudgingly mutual respectfulness a la Spock McCoy, that for me fell flat. It may get there, but this feels forced. But give me more Reno one lines, please. Uh, we talked a little bit about that during the uh, uh, podcast. And uh, me and Bob were going to have words. Well, it, the <laughs> lines work. It's the, the lines work, but it was kind of. It was a little bit of the whole, like, the, the character itself, serving maybe. the plot. Yeah, character serving the plot rather than plot serving the characters. Sure. So that that's what I notice with that. And I, I, I think they the 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 characters make it work. I think that I think the scene itself may have been a little lacking, but yeah. The the previous thing that uh, he said about Giorgio. That will come up again later because I have I have something that I'm going to put in my other notes, and it is a Section 31 theory. Mm. We'll get to it later, but stay tuned. It's a big one. Okay, so um, he says, lastly, is it me or does Mary Wiseman look bigger? Her face seems fuller, or was it just the costume? I know she got married in February 2019. Could she be pregnant? That's all for now, your friend Bob. And my response to that is, honestly, I don't think Mary Wiseman is pregnant. And I would agree that she may have uh, gained a few pounds. She, She may... She does look a little heavier, at least in the face this season. I do notice it, but I will say that's okay. Um, in fact, I think they're trying to show that Star Trek is a, an inclusive place, like a bo- body positive space, and um, there shouldn't be any fat shaming in Star Trek. You know, and I'm a person who has struggled with my weight pretty much all my life. Um, and I was what you would call overweight almost all of my life. There were a few years in high school and maybe my first two years in, in college where uh, I wasn't overweight, but all the rest of that time I was. So, um, but even when I was thinner, I was still struggling really hard, um, to, to keep the weight. And, uh, you know, the, this year, you know, probably partially due to COVID anyway, I, like I've lost actually quite a bit of weight. I've done the opposite of what most people have done. Uh, but, you know, it, like it's just not okay. And, you know, so people have, you know, done things over the years to abuse people and thought nothing of it, you know, call them fatso, call them, you know, I've heard all the the terrible things in um you know, growing up and even like 
as an adult. It's just not, it's not cool. And, you know, it shouldn't matter. And uh, so I think it's cool if um, Wiseman, you know, has, has gained a few pounds. I don't think it really matters. And I think it's a good thing to show that not everyone has to, you know, ha- look like a model on, uh, on Star Trek. I think it's like, it's just unrealistic body images. So. Anyway, that's my take on it. Well, I was going to say she looks, when they had the uh, ready room, she yeah. looked she looked like she may have uh, taken a little bit off. So, yeah. I mean, you can fluctuate. It's okay. Right. Yeah. And just to be be positive with you, even when I was in a career field where I had, you know, I couldn't weigh over a certain period, you know, I never made my table weight cause I'm not built that way. Right. You know, I was, I always had to get taped. So I, I agree with you. It's, it's okay that we've got a few differently shaped people. Right. All right. Uh, he has one additional piece of feedback that came in, Uh, A little later, he says, I did have a theory that I came up with after I had already sent in my review for 302. The first episode was titled That Hope Is You Part One. I think that the showrunners knew that they were renewed for season four well in advance of the announcement. So my theory is that episode 401 will be That Hope Is You Part Two. And I'll say... I think that's a good theory. It may be possible, Bob. What do you guys think? I think it'll tear me up inside. <laughs> it'll drive me insane. <laughs> er. <laughs> er. Yeah, yeah, er. <laughs> exactly. We'll see. I, I don't know, man. Right now, I'm... I'm waiting for this season. Yeah. Well, I mean... We've seen the the listing of the titles, and I don't believe that that hope is you part two is in one, one of those titles, at least what I see on like Wikipedia, for example, um, is they have the full list now. And, uh, that hope is you part two is not in the list. They forgot. There is a two part episode called Terra Firma that's listed as a two part episode, but I mean, there's no, one of those could be that hope is you part two, I guess. But, you know, as it stands right now, there isn't a uh, part two. But I think Bob is correct that they knew that the show was going to be renewed because there had been discussions and talk about the fact that it had been renewed for a long time. So that's why when we mentioned it on the podcast we said it was like the best kept you know, the the worst kept secret in television you know that it was going to be renewed so because there had even been discussions about a season five you know so i think that uh it's likely that um they did know that it was going to be a season four you know so anyway All right. I think that's it for Bob's feedback. So our next bit of feedback is from Brian from Colorado. So James, what do you think about uh, doing that one? All right. So Brian from Colorado, formerly from Hawaii. Brian says, I rate season three, episode two, 9.5 bar brawls. I really liked the Tilly Saru moments and the Giorgio fight scene. The old West tropes offered a bit of whimsy, making it interesting and fun to watch. We got to see the seeds of what will likely develop over the rest of the season. Saru Giorgio tension, Tilly character development, funny Jet Reno moments, and the Discovery crew starting to clean up the Wild West that has emerged sans Federation. This season is shaping up really well so far. I think it will probably be even more than season two with lighter, more positive moments. I would agree with that. All right. So that's it for um, the additional feedback that we got for 
the episode, but we did get some episode feedback. Feedback. <laughs> All right. Uh, LT, you want to take the first one? All right. Comic Geek Kev says, just listen to the podcast and I screwed up my question regarding Nod. I meant to ask why, if she was security, why was she in charge of repairs? <laughs> And if that was a function of a rank, I would think that it would be more of an engineer thing. But what do I know? Sorry for the confusion. Can I field this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I got you down for the next response. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for uh, for for that question, uh, as as a guy that was in the Navy, so this is kind of my forte. Uh, repairs to the ship always, always, always come first. Everybody lends a hand regardless of what your primary function is. So Comic Geek Kev, your job, regardless of what it is, repairs to the ship come first. Get that ship up and running and then get back to security. There you go. That makes sense. Yep. It's like we always have to pull maintenance on our vehicles. It doesn't matter what your actual job is. You've got to get out to the motor pool and pull dipsticks. So you got it. All right. There's a response to, uh, that bit of feedback from Brian. Um, you want to read that one? Oh, James? my apologies. No, <laughs> and Brian, fine. Brian from Colorado, <laughs> I guess answered it. And I didn't even realize, uh, Brian from Colorado, Kevin, I noticed that too. Assumed it was just due to the, her rank. She was coordinating repairs. It was Saru's order, and she was surprised by it. What surprised me even more was when Tilly said that Giorgio was an engineer. That's news to me. And Comic Geek Kev replies to Brian from Colorado. I was surprised that she was, I think. The first time we've heard Giorgio as an engineer, too. But it makes as much sense as any other specialty becoming a captain. Or emperor, in this case. Yeah, and I... And I got in on this, so I said, based on what um, Comic Geek Kev said originally about that, you know, that he was asking why a security person would be in charge of repairs. I'm like, okay, it, it makes more sense, but it's kind of confusing with not with non. And I've gone back and I did a recent, you know, rewatch, and I watched it you know, season, the season two, episode one brother, when we first see her and it is announced that, um, Pike is coming with her, um, you know, a science officer and an engineering officer. So she is introduced as an engineer, not security. So I don't really understand that part of it. You know, is she both? I don't know, but you know, when, they needed an, you know, a, a chief of security. They made her chief of security, even though she was supposedly an engineer. So I don't know, but um, the thing about Giorgio and I meant to go look back at this. I actually have the page open, um, so I'm going to check to see this. So no, this this, this will other, this will also go uh, toward another uh, modern day Navy thing that they, that they're probably basing this on as well mm -hmm. is commissioned officers in the Navy will start off doing tours in different departments. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of times some of their lower, uh, junior officer tours will be in engineering departments, uh, as, uh, divisional officers or department heads, uh, in engineering, uh, as far as like, you know, auxiliary systems officer or a main propulsion officer or things like that, damage control officer, uh, yeah. different types of things. So they can get the feel for different workings of the ship, uh, so that they have, so that they know how every, every function of the ship works so that they can, have an all around understanding of the ship and that, and that just makes sense to, to have that within a captain, um, to, to have a well-rounded captain, uh, when, when it comes time to take command. Right. Um, yeah. So as far as Giorgio being an engineer, I, I just went and looked back on the memory alpha page 
and I don't see anything mentioned about her being an engineer on that, but I could swear maybe there's something in like beta cannon. I don't know that she was an engineer. Um, so anyway, there's, there's something that, that indicates at some point in her career that she was an engineer. Um, but, uh, going to your point, um, James, we've seen officers do this before. Like for example, Worf, Worf was in tactical. He went to, uh, chief of security. Then when he left to go to deep space nine, he was like, I don't even remember what his title was, but he, he went back into red from being gold. Um, he also Jordy started Le- as Khan, I thought. Right. Uh, or, yeah, or was, I th- was it we Khan did, or Ops? Uh, we did sorry. see, we did see him. We did see him in, in one of the, uh, yeah, I think he was in at Khan. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But he's, mo- he's definitely moved around. Yeah. Yeah. And of course we've seen LaForge move around. And of course, like in first year he was, he was at the, he was at Khan and then he also, uh, moved to, you know, in second year he moved to engineering and it's kind of like, you know, he went from con to chief of engineering. So, uh, where he stayed, but still, you know, we, we have seen that before, so it's, it's not unprecedented. Um, but anyway, my point, uh, about Giorgio is I could swear that I've heard something about her being an engineer, um, and maybe it's in beta canon, or maybe it was even something about the Terran emperor was an engineer. I don't know, but I don't remember the Terran en- uh, emperor being an engineer, but I seem to remember something about her Giorgio being an engineer, but I, I couldn't find it. It might've been in one of those, uh, novels, prequel novels. Yeah. Or it was a throwaway line. Yeah. Or it could have been even like, um, in the short track, maybe she had a, she had, uh, bronze instead of, uh, gold or silver, you know, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember what she had on, but okay. So, um, let's, let's move on to, uh, we have one more bit of feedback from Wes from Minnesota. He says, yes, you're right. Brian about the F bomb spoken a lot in Picard. However, I think I meant the third time in discovery, my bad. And that is, uh, laughing my ass off, uh, emoji. So rolling yes. on the floor, laughing, rolling on. The, what are you, Ruthie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am Ruthie today. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I don't know. I still, I, I'm still emo- emoji challenged. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's move on to this week's episode, season three, episode three, titled People of Earth, written by Bo Young Kim and Erica Lippolt, who are, uh, I believe there are supervising producers for this show and they are co-creators of the supposed section 31 series directed by legendary Riker, uh, number one now captain, uh, Jonathan Frakes. The description from cbs.com is as follows. Finally reunited Burnham and the USS discovery crew journey to earth eager to learn what happened to the Federation in their absence. That's TVMA with coarse language, a way out star date of eight, six, five, two, one, one point three. That is the first six digit star date we ever heard of an air date of October 28th, 2020 at 11, 11 PM is when I was first able to get to it. That's of course, Pacific time. 2 11 a.m. on the 29th Eastern time. And its runtime was 48 minutes and 31 seconds. So James, what did you think of this episode? Uh, I gave people of earth an 8.975. We get it. You're smart. You're all real smart. (laughs) What about you LT? I got it out of order here, but. I'm giving it an 8.75. Museums are cool. 
and we're all um, about the same here, but uh, I'm going to, and this will be controversial, but I'm going to go with it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to give it a nine. Make Earth great again. Oh, no. Well, we had to have one arbitrary nine. It's mega. Yeah. But anyway, um, please do not be offended by that. That was, that was meant in, in humor. Um, but anyway, this, I, I didn't, I didn't love this episode as much. I would say that, um, no, not as good as the first two. It's very, yeah, very nah. expositionary. It was very expositionary and it was actually, if that's some, a word. It is. It and is. Okay, good. Cause, cause Google said it wasn't. <laughs> maybe not exactly a word it's um, expositional that's what it, that's what it said there, it was, was a word but but not but expositionary the main thing is that like it was something that we kind of needed to move on yes um but at the same time there were some things that could have made it better so it was a combination of it it lost points just out of the the box just because it was more expositional than um than the first two episodes but there were also some execution uh issues i think Mm -hmm. that um caused it to to go down a little more than that so uh all in all you know good episode certainly a good episode but not um not as good as the first two all right so um and if i want to um if I want to give it a like a rating from within the uh, within the episode itself, I guess I would say nine trees don't come that wide. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I'm not going to body shame a tree, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, all right. So let's move on to our listener ratings and uh, James. All uh, right. Comic Geek Kev gives this episode 9.2 out of 10 study trees. Ed over from Arizona gives it 8.9. Diplomacy is slow. Jeff, X-Force 11, gives it 8.9. Cake is eternal. Wes from Minnesota says, I just wanted to say that Discovery's third season is really starting off really strong. I give People of Earth 10.5 eternal cakes out of 10. Yes, I am aware it's above 10, but this episode was so damn good that it deserves it. Haley from Colorado says, 8.75, love the hair. John from North Carolina says, nine worlds that grudge really is a queen over with a uh, smirking face and sunglasses. Rick from Cleveland, I wanted to love this episode more than I actually did. I rate it 8.5 rashes, that damn uniform, out of 10. A little low for Freak's episode, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I would say the same. And lastly, Mike from the internet. I'm sorry, Mike, I'm not sure where you're from. A 9.5 out of 10. Okay, so now it is time for our yeses. And, of course, we have our new yes. Yes! <laughs> okay, I will I will start it off. All right. Uh our first listener yes is from Comic Geek Kev. He says, reunited and it feels so good. Oh, that was terrible. Oh, that was awful. Reunited and it feels so good. Okay. Sorry, Ruthie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The scene of Burnham. Greeting the crew was great. As usual, Doug Jones's Saru was spot on. He's got that character and the movements down. So impressive. Burnham acquiescing command to Saru was the right thing to do on every level. I'll just stop there and I'll say I agree. Um, I really think that was the only choice. I guess it was kind of surprising for at least Saru for her to just, you know, say, nope. Nope, nope. Um, but it it actually kind of makes sense given what she's gone through, I guess. But 
Uh, he continues. He says the Burnham Tilly scene when Tilly asks if Burnham let them go. That whole thing was amazing. Mary Wiseman is so good as Tilly. Yes, she is. Book looks good in a Starfleet uni- uniform. One I we're not pirates. Smiley face. <laughs> yeah. The final scene with the bridge crew in front of the tree and pulling back to show the Academy and San Francisco while the theme music plays very, very well done. And then it's last, even without action scenes, Giorgio is priceless. Says a man who jumps a starship through mushroom space. (laughs) Yeah, I like that line. She had a few good lines this episode. I just want to say a little dad humor there. Doesn't one eye make you a pirate because you're wearing an eye patch? Oh, terrible. I know. I'm sorry. Anyway, Wes from Minnesota says the entire episode, it definitely felt like Star Trek through and through. Bo Yon Kim and Erica Lippel, the episode's writers, and Jonathan Frakes did an excellent job with the characters, the story, and the way things were laid out for all of us. The episode should be seen in modern times, that's for sure. Oh, and by the way, have I mentioned that we now have Saru firmly in the captain's chair? Thank God. A long time coming. Thank you. The first alien captain in Star Trek history. That's part of the main cast of characters. And Edwin from Arizona says yes to Burnham's new hairstyle. I would agree. All right. Rick from Cleveland says... There were plenty of yeses for this week. Yes for Giorgio promoting herself to Admiral. This was a fun way to have her make it clear that she will do her own thing and not truly answer to Saru or anyone else. Yes for Tilly and Michael seen at the Com Badge Memorial in the hallway. This did a number of important things. It showed not only the Discovery is mourning their losses, but also a reminder that the Discovery crew themselves are lost, looking for anything familiar to cling to, even cake. Yes to Adira in the Spore Lab. She played well with Stamets and Tilly, and the bit where she sabotaged the ship to the extent she did in seconds suggests that she will help the crew adjust to the technology gap. Yes, finally, for the scene at the tree. It was good to see the crew get that release and ground themselves in something familiar. And Tilly, as always, bringing out the youth in us. Five more minutes, please. Yeah. I agree. Okay, so that is it for our uh, listener yeses. James, what yes, are your additional yeses? So I really like the fact that we got to see a Zindi insectoid outside of Enterprise. Uh, you know, they made it to the new millennium, right? I mean, well, wait, um, uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> are you referring to the... Um, <laughs> Well, the, when the mask, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was a little disappointed with that. So I, it started off to be a yes. And then I was like, oh, it was a mask. Really? Um, I was really excited to see that. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> um, I threw that in there for, for humor, but it, it was a dad joke. Thanks. Dad. Um, you're welcome. Uh, but uh, a true yes, though, is uh, is the d- the dynamic between uh, Burnham and Book. Um, I, I really think they they do play well off of one another as like a buddy type duo. That being said, though, did, did anybody else notice the uh, the look that she kind of gave him uh, when she was kind of helping him all helping him get the the uniform jacket on and the badge? Um, yeah. That that was almost kind of like a like I I want to rip your clothes off look. I don't know. I I kind of I don't know. I didn't. That almost kind of gave it a no for me, but I'll explain when we get to the nose. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other yes would be the uh, the closing scene, uh, as as was mentioned earlier with the uh, at, at Starfleet Academy. I, I think it was really good for to help everybody get kind of grounded and to help them relate to the new when that they uh, that they're now in to help them kind of acclimate themselves to uh, to where they're at. Um, cause I was a little bit hard on Tilly last week, uh, with her whole self-esteem and confidence issue. Uh, and, uh, Ruthie's feedback really helped me out. So thank you, Ruthie, for, uh, for your feedback on, uh, on kind of grounding me in that on being a little hard on Tilly. And that's all I got. 
All right. LT, what do you have? Um, I listed as a yes, the pan shot at the beginning of the episode when they showed all the Federation ships before they all exploded. And just being a kind of a hardware guy, I enjoyed seeing what the design team was going to show us for the pre-burned Federation ships. Because one of the things they've talked about with Discovery is how they're close to what we're expecting for Federation ships, but they made a few little design changes. So it's always good to see you know what they're what they're putting out for ship designs. Yeah. So I thought that was a really cool shot. I really enjoyed the interaction between Book and Giorgio in the transporter room. Yeah. Of all the people I expected to be working the transporter console. Yeah, you know, it wasn't the Empress. Yeah. And just the just the dialogue between her and Book just loved it. I just really did. Um one of the things I loved about this episode and the series so far is I made a comment about it earlier this week that it seems like it's a hell on wheels reunion show. Um <laughs> the guy the guy under James Zindy helmet you know, was one of the characters from Hell on Wheels is the Swede. And I was, I can't think of the actor's name, but just uh, absolutely love the way he delivers lines as a character actor. You know, that he's, he's just got that. He had the bad guy gravitas in, in Hell on Wheels. And he, and he carried a little bit of that with him in this as our uh, Raider from Titan. So, wondering who else they're going to pull out. If they're going to see some of the other cast members, since we got Anson Mount first. <laughs> and everybody else has said it. I'm going to say it. I really was excited to see Saru in the center center chair. One thing about it, and it's you know, props to Doug Jones, but the way he carried himself in that second episode when we saw him, after they came out of the wormhole, I've noticed a little shift in the way that he's playing Saru. You know, Saru seems way more, well, not way more, but more serious. Um, you know, he seems like that he's, he understands the gravity of the situation they're in and has just been, the way they wrote him was so solid and that he's taking charge and he's keeping everybody together. Um, I'll get to it a little bit later, but you know, the interaction between, uh, him and Detmer, you could tell that, you know, this is not, this is not a uh, fear factor Saru anymore. <laughs> he is, fear factor, sir. he is definitely, you know, owning that chair and I, I'm, I'm excited to see it and I'm excited to see what, what comes from that. Cool. All right. Well, um, my yeses, I think, are, I would say that it was a surprising turn of events what they gave us for um, Earth. Uh, I did not expect Earth to have pulled out of the Federation. Um, I can't get over how similar or how not similar. It's not exactly the same, but how it uh, works well with how things are right now. Um, in fact, you know, it's funny because all of this show was shot way before COVID, but, you know, now we kind of have a world where we're all, you know, countries that travel is uh, under rare circumstances. Uh, you know, travel from country to country is not allowed. Um, so, you know, there's that there's, there's the, you know, the, the whole like, uh, isolationist, you know, nationalist policy and stuff like that. It is similar. Um, but at the same time, like you have to wonder, it's like, well, what, what would happen if you were a part of this vast federation and suddenly, um, cause if you could, if you want to think about it, so there's 700 years past Burnham 
and you know, so so roughly twenty nine something, right? Sometime in the thirtieth century, the dilithium supplies ran out, and then roughly like a hundred years after that, or so, um, boom, you know. So like so th- things got excuse me things got scarce, which wouldn't have. You know, because they had ways of recrystallizing dilithium that wouldn't like completely, you know, shut things down. But uh, once, you know, once all these ships exploded and it made it a lot, you know, more difficult to travel, um, that would really make things hard. And, you know, it's it's kind of funny because I think in a lot of ways it's it's mirrored what's happened now. And um, it's just kind of, it, it's amazing in a way, in a bad way, and in a good way. But anyway, I did not expect them to show Earth like this. Like, it, it just, but it, it makes so much sense. Like, it was, it's like I say, I didn't expect it. But once I saw it, it's like, oh, that makes so much, so much sense to see Earth like this in this case. Um you know, hoarding, stockpiling, all of that stuff. But that said, there are a couple of things about it that don't ring true to me, which we'll get to, you know, in our notes and our um, hold your horses. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is um, something I should have wrote down. Um, no, I guess I I am interested in the whole um Adira relationship and how, where that goes. I think that'll be interesting. Uh, I like the fact that we have a human trill. I didn't see that as the spin. Um, it does make sense that, you know, they would have been able to figure out like how to keep a human, you know, trill without like the health complications that Riker had, um, you know, severed you know, 800 years have passed. So, you know, that make, that part of it makes sense to me. Um, I liked how Burnham kind of did her thing, but they could have done that better. So I'm going to have more to say about that when the time comes. So it was, it was good, but at the same time, there were certain parts of it I didn't like. Okay. Well, anyway, that's it for our yeses so let's move on to our nose and then we have our new no 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 <laughs> <laughs> all right james why don't you do the first one all right comic comic geek kev book is gone already i have to think we'll see him again maybe a last minute save i hope they don't go back to that well actually they did it last season with saru's sister and the klingons no, non. I didn't even see her in the background. I would have thought when the ship was boarded, they would have at least had her some had her get some screen time. I mean, we even got a glimpse of Linus. Yeah, I have to agree with that one. And we didn't have Don. We didn't have Reno. We didn't have Culber. And that kind of thing that they do where we kind of see this like rotating list of stars, you kind of feel it there. So. I didn't appreciate that so much because I did feel like those characters were kind of missing in this. Like, even if it was just like a short, you know, little scene and I don't know, maybe you just work it out so that you take them off the credits this this week, uh, make them a cameo or something. I don't know. It seems to me not having them there. It, it just, it seems, yeah, it's, it's, it seems like it takes away from, from the show a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something that I'm going to say in, in a minute. Um, you can kind of see the seams, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So that's my take on it. You kind of see the seams of like, Oh, this is kind of like, you know, how they're, how they're making the donuts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Making the donuts. See this. It, it doesn't right. match, you know, just right, right. work with me, work with me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The, making the sausage. You're, you're making the sausage, and you see 
the skin of the sausage be made. And you don't need to see that. You don't need to see how the sausage is made. You just need to eat the sausage and the sausage is good. You don't need to see the little things. And, and what we're talking about is just that whole production thing. You're seeing the production pieces of like what it takes to make a series. And then you go, well, why is this person not here? So yeah, I agree. Yep. All right. Next. LT, oh. next. That's, orange. That's, orange. <laughs> uh, West from Minnesota says, I can't find any faults other than another human having a trill symbiont. We saw it with Riker in the host, TNG, struggling to keep in line with it. Maybe medical advances have progressed in the last 700 years since, since that episode that humans can be joined in the same way trills do. I just thought it was weird. Well, I mean, I have I, a I get, theory. All right. My theory is we're, you know, I'll, I'll tack my, my five quat to the, to the dashboard here. I'm betting that something happened to the Admiral's host. And I don't think, I don't think she was the prime candidate, but they're like, we got to put the symbiote into somebody. Yeah. And for whatever reason, you know, they were, they were the one. Yeah. Because we, like everybody keeps saying, you know, human hosts for Krill are not common because of all the side effects and all the other things. So it struck me more as, you know, you're in the middle of, you know, you're in Hoboken and you can't get to a, to a, to Trill to get to a real uh carrier for the symbiont so you do the best you can yeah and, and i i and i i had that in my in my hold your horses and it's because she just didn't have any side effects from it and she seems totally fine with it and it's just i don't know i don't have a problem with it given the fact that like if this was 24th century if this was tng DS9 yeah era then yes i yeah. i can see that but this is you know 800 years in the future of that so yeah to me, and, I, and i guess that's why it's not a no for me and it's just a hold yeah. your horses yeah yeah because uh, because i guess they can explain it away yeah and yeah. i think they probably will yeah but i think i think you're probably right lt there probably was some accident that makes mm. it you know either that or there weren't enough um trills on earth when it happened or you know so something but like obviously not the prime candidate but i think it also like if we saw a trill we'd be like oh there's a trill oh i bet that's the admiral or something like that you know we would kind of um we'd perk up yeah we'd, we'd notice yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so i think uh that kind of gives uh like an additional reason why but I would also say that um, it's also a plot point too. It makes kind of sense that they would make it so that the character can't access all of the memories right away. Right. Because um, it would be too easy. Right. Exactly. It would be too easy. But, so. but she seemed to have access to the memories. She seemed to have some access to the memories, but not total access to the memories she seemed so if quite a bit <laughs> did, i mean she really she, uh, I mean, she she knew like pretty much everything about discovery like right away and knew exactly like well yeah but <laughs> she she's a smart I mean, she's smart from the future so yeah yeah but, but i mean she she knew exactly like what points i mean she she was like oh this is your your pilot interface and it interfaces with 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 your with your bridge uh and navigation for yeah but my you know, and it's like how would you know this in, well, unless unless you were familiar with the schematics of discovery you know so well we might find that out that it seemed more to me that it was just like somebody staring under the hood of a car going hey that little that belt yeah. makes the wheel go around and that's connected what's this to this yeah what's this thing gonna do Thingamadoo, thank you. It's not doohickey, it's thingamadoo. Thingamadoo-doo. <laughs> yes, we have to call it a thingamadoo. 
That's, that's correct. That's a trademark. <laughs> James's trademark. Mine right there. <laughs> Thing of a do, ding. Yeah, mm-hmm. but but anyway, I I think that there are specific. Um, it makes sense for the plot, and it's like there there are some things that I'm seeing here. Like in this episode, there were there were some thoughts of, like I said, you can see the seams. Like you can kind of see where the characters are acting a certain way to drive the plot a certain way, which is never something I like to see. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, But we're seeing, this is, this is a thing where it's like, okay, you have, you have to introduce a new character. Um, Who would know about what happened? Well, someone who's long lived, who's long lived. Well, a trill. Okay. Well, how do you make it so that a trill can't access the things that they need to, well, you know, make them uh, not be totally trill. So, okay. So, you know, so that, that kind of thing, it, it makes sense for the story and it's not a question of the seams being there. Like it's not, you're not, it's, it's not, it's not a constructed type of thing. It makes sense for what the, the story is. Um, It's where, some other things that I, I saw this episode where the, there were some things where they could have done a better job that right. I, I took exception to. So we have one more no, and that is from Rick from my former stomping ground of Cleveland. He says, there's a no I cannot get past. At the end of episode two, Samus is in pretty rough shape and needs to go to sick bay to get his wounds tended again. This episode picks up right after that, and Stamets is in the transporter room to greet Burnham and healthy enough to jump the ship to Earth shortly afterward. This is a continuity problem that could have been fixed by not having him in the transporter room and making it at least seem like a day passes while they decide to go to Earth. You know, Rick, I have to say, based on that, that is a point that I did not think of, and now I have to question my nine. So kudos to you, because uh, I, that's a point that I didn't pick up on. Like, I did pick up on another continuity problem, not so, like, episode to episode. Mine is more like long-term kind of kind of continuity. But yeah, I would have to agree that is kind of a gaffe, wouldn't you guys say? Yeah, that he makes a great point there. I mean, they they could have at least had had book kind of come in and maybe have book bring some kind of tech to heal him. Maybe after book comes aboard, but well, maybe he finally got his fifth cycle in the cellular regenerator. But it still would have taken a few cycles. Well, true. Yeah, but but this was like instantaneous, and. I mean, I, I could I could have seen maybe after book is aboard, but Rick Rick even brings it up that it's as Burnham comes in, Stamets is already yeah up and about and just like, hey, how you doing? I'm fine, <laughs> you know. So it's like whatever, you know. <laughs> and yep. it does seem he like does- you went from being totally effed up in the in the Jeffries tube to hey, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Well. And- it's like, oh, you're you're claustrophobic, and now you're good from after you're out of the Jeffries tool. Well, I mean, come on, Stamets survived his "I'm never going to do this again" to doing it again to seemingly happily doing it again. Yeah, maybe it's the mushrooms. Maybe he might be just tripping. <laughs> well, you know those <laughs> those mushrooms are he's got are pretty mycelium. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's I, it's that's definitely it's got to be a gaff, and yeah, they they should probably kind of take a look at that. <laughs> well, it's too late. Yeah. I mean. All right. So speaking of uh, gaffs, uh, James, <laughs> is your turn for the gaffs? Uh, what do you have for nose? So my my biggest one was, and uh, as I said, I was going to go into it. Uh, it it kind of goes with with my yeses, uh, the dynamic between Michael and Book. While I like their their buddy chemistry, I kind of dislike the 
there there almost seems to be a, a sexual tension that I I don't I don't find that it's necessary because there was like a look that she gives him while she's put helping him put the uniform on. And yeah, I mean it's it's great that she can have a relationship or whatever, but I mean it's just not necessary. I mean, she's a strong enough character, she's a great actress, she's a beautiful woman, but I mean, it doesn't mean that she has to have a relationship in every season. It's just completely unnecessary to me. And she is such a great actress that she can just be an independent character. And it's just completely unnecessary to me. And they can be a Han and Chewie and it's just fine. So it's just, I don't have them get in a relationship. And I feel like TV just for some reason has to put a beautiful woman with a guy and they're probably going to do it. I feel like it's a foreshadowing of something to come, and I don't like it. And I just hit my head on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and we and we all know that moonlighting was better before they exactly. And and I think that's gonna I, th- I think that's gonna kill the that entire dynamic if they do have them get together. And I think that's what they're gonna do. There is a. It's not exactly the same, but there's something called the Bechdel test. I don't know if you ever heard it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bechdel yeah. Wallace test. And it's basically about leading uh, women. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, if if two women talk to each other mm-hmm. a, and, you know, if, if all they're talking about is a man, um, yep. that that's kind of a no, no. And mm-hmm. I, I think there's probably a related thing where it's like they have to have. I don't know. A certain it's, criteria to make them like a, a, a yeah. legit leading woman. Yeah. Uh, where I, I think Sonequa really just, she's, she's an amazing actress and she doesn't need a leading man to, to help support her. Yeah. And, and for, and I, I can never remember the, the actor that portrays book. I mean, he's a, he's a great actor. David and, Ajala. Thank you. David Ajala. He's, he's a great actor and I think they play off each other well, but they they don't need to be romantically linked uh, and i'm sorry but if they do link them together that's just a big no for me yeah um just just leave them as buddies it's fine and uh, i mean hell the the whole i almost made the rating the whole maneuver that they were talking about oh well i'm sober this time so it might work <laughs> um but the that, Ar- that was, was it the iran tango it, it was something the, the something seven and they're like oh you want to do that and he's like Oh, well, let me, let me down this drink. He's like, oh, and she's like, oh, it's sent the hall. And he's like, oh, well, well, I guess I'm sober. So it might work. (laughs) (laughs) I just thought that was hilarious. They they just play, they they play off each other so well when they're, when they're just friendly with each other. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just no reason for it to be romantic together. Um, But uh, enough on that, I guess. Um, The, uh, the other big thing for me was the, uh, the, the the whole Earth Protocol um, was was really inconsistent to me with how they handled when it was like when when came in to 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 report that that they had the, the disaster on the colony and they just started shooting at them yeah and it was like they didn't even ask them anything they just they were just like hey get out of here and start shooting at them and Discovery comes in and they hail them and it's like that's pretty pretty inconsistent um, so it it just didn't make sense to me that's a big no for me it's like to i mean i realize there's a, a span of time that that took place there but still i mean it's what what changed in their in their sops to 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 say hey let's let's just sh- shoot these guys but hey since this ship looks familiar we're gonna we're gonna hail them first i mean why are we gonna hail the millennia old ship that is probably stolen because it's a millennium old i mean it was probably a drift so, yeah. you know, why would we hail that ship and just shoot at this other one? <laughs> that just makes no sense to me. And that's, that's a big no for me. I, I mean, maybe it was because it was so old or because it would, they recognized it as a Starfleet ship. I don't, I don't know. It's, it just, it doesn't make sense though. There's, there's no yeah. consistency with that. It, yeah. It's, and it does, it just makes n- zero yeah. sense. I, I do agree. Uh, well, the one thing maybe you could say is that if they knew about when, because obviously it seems that they know about when, maybe they would take a more aggressive posture towards when because 
But the thing is, is they didn't know about when well un- they, until when came and then they didn't ask any questions about when. I will digress. And they, I think when they, did when come? No, they because <laughs> you know first they base when to to God, shoot this at is them. a bunch of guys doing a podcast, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think that the Raider captain had already been in. I think they had already contacted him, and I don't think this was their first their first time running up yeah. on each other, and they just yeah. didn't know about Titan. Yeah. That was the impression that I got. Yeah. That yeah, was but, my impression as well. But it but it seemed like it's it's it seemed like the the Raider captain tried to contact him and Earth wouldn't listen and just and just shot first is is the impression that I got. Yeah. Well, that that was actually gonna be part of my nose is that like, you're telling me that Titan is not that far away and yet you can't get a signal out to them. Right. Like, what, Cause, cause what? Titan is a moon of Mars, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, Titan we're talking about, right? It's Jupiter. A, is it? Ju- hold on. I thought Titan was a moon of Mars. I don't no. think it's either. Mars is Deimos and Phobos. Oh, is it? Saturn. Well, Saturn. Saturn. Yeah. Okay. Saturn, Oop. Jupiter, Mars. It's, same thing. Nope. <laughs> Saturn, Saturn, Jupiter, and Uranus. <laughs> or, or further out. <laughs> oh, That's a Beavis and Butthead thing. God, the dad jokes are rolling tight. Man. <laughs> yeah. Where's Ruthie? The Klingons are attacking Uranus. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's why James is giggling so much. Yeah, but anyway, that was my my take on it. This is supposed to be like you would think the burn would have happened. This is 32nd century. So the burn happened in 31st century. You couldn't get a signal or for that matter, your sensors couldn't operate like far enough to see what was going on at Titan. Right. Like it just, I don't know. There's, there's something about that, that I I just, I don't buy. Well, they didn't talk about Luna. They didn't talk about moon call and they didn't talk about whatever was still on. And and how is on how Mars is Earth too. Is Mars yeah. still burning? And <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. And how is Earth that self sufficient that they that they just completely close themselves off? Well, I don't have a problem with them being that self sufficient. I but do. I am being how are you gonna be that much of an island uh, from the rest of the universe? Well, it's Earth, right? And okay. and well <laughs> but uh, my point being is that y- you probably have you probably have the world, like the world that's like the center of the Federation at, at the time of, of everything. It was probably like, you know, had everything you could possibly want. And but it's, what but it's they a didn't single, have. It's, right. a, it's a single planet with limited resources, though. Well, you're dancing. You're dancing in the mono here in a second. So Okay. Well, then okay. let's <laughs> let's get into your nose then, LT. Well, um, James. James. You you got one more, bro. Oh yeah, no Jet Reno. What the? F- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Go ahead. I didn't. I didn't want to deny you I, your I, love I can... of Jet Reno. Okay. What the? F- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, they let they let me say. Sh- so. <laughs> yeah, I've got the options here. That, <laughs> this was from this is from Lord X, <laughs> and this is what we had before. So, yeah, no jet, Reno. I, I agree, you know, should have been there. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's like like we were talking about before, um, this rotating thing that they do. Like, it makes sense that Booker wouldn't be in every episode, but, like, Cobra, um, Non, Reno, I, I don't know. And I wish it would just, like I said last week in last week's episode, I wish that they would just, say who the chief medical officer is, who the chief engineer is, who the chief science officer. Well, we know who the science officer is sort of, um, you know, like they just don't, they don't say those things. And I wish that they would go ahead and name our division heads. Yes. You know, Please. Curious minds want to know. Yes. And like, I don't see a reason why they don't. And if, 
if I ever had a chance to interview the producers, that would be one of my questions. Like, why haven't you said that such and such is the chief engineer? You know, yeah. like just make her the chief engineer and be over, be done with it. Like, yeah, and it if should she's be not, Reno. right. And if she's not the chief engineer, who is the chief engineer? And, and please make that person, you yeah, know, Reno. Argyle. Yeah. No, Argyle. Jet <laughs> anyway. Okay. So let's, let's move on. Uh, LT, what do you have? Okay. My no, as we sort of have beat around. Uh, so earth just said GTFO to the Federation. Yeah. Uh, my problem with it is we, we dealt with like Terra prime in enterprise. You know, we, we've seen isolation movements on earth, yeah. but if you, but if you look at it, who was the driving force be- between getting everybody to shake hands and form the first agreements that led to the Federation? It was earth. Right. You know, where's Starfleet freaking Academy on earth? Right. You know, where, where are some of the primary shipyards for the Federation earth now, or, or in the Sol system. Or if you want to, if you want to be, and I realize this is horribly humanocentric of me to say, but was Earth pulling out one of the reasons the Federation had so many issues and you had people bailing out? And if you want to look at it from, again, a humanocentric kind of perspective, when you saw crews of ships which species was the one that really wanted to go out and had the drive to explore? You know, they've always right. commented that the human, the human race has been the one that wanted to go out and explore and see new things. Uh, traditionally, they've said it in canon. The Vulcans weren't that much of uh, an explorer race. Right. Um, we could say that just based on, previous thought patterns maybe the andorians were more conquest oriented sort of like the klingons right. were right so is it a chicken and the egg kind of thing that when earth bailed the federation collapsed because nobody else was ready to pick up the slack but yeah but the problem i have with it is earth was so invested in the federation there were so many things about the federation that you know, earth was a driver of, I just can't, I'm, I'm having problems with them just saying, you know, you know, later and, you know, just kind of doing their own thing. I, to me, yes. Like you were saying, it sort of reflects modern times. It sort of reflects things we're seeing in the world today. Right. But I would counter that in, we've already had, you know, what the ghosts of our better nature, we've had things where the Federation was supposed to stand for these ideals. And was it just so long that the earth forgot about all that stuff? I, like I said, just the whole thing with earth pulling out of the Federation, I just, it seemed like it was a little too contrived for me, maybe. And, and to your point where, where was, where was the where was where were the Vulcans as as Earth's kind of logical conscience to say, hey, uh, where what are you guys thinking with this emotional response and pulling out of the Federation that you guys actually founded? I have a feeling we're going to find out that they just they just went deuces. Yeah, right. They're, they're gone <laughs> because we and, told you. And <laughs> no, uh, right. spoiler, you know, yeah. just so you you. You all know one of the episode titles this this time long is season three, episode seven is titled Unification Three. Hmm. So that to me suggests that perhaps there was a unification between the Romulans, Romulans and Vulcans. And Vulcans. Yeah. You know, so that um, we'll see then. And you know that also makes me wonder because um, we know that. The Romulans had warp based on a different kind of propulsion system. They had 
the used the quantum, quantum, singularities. The quantum singularities. Yeah, yeah, so it's possible that their engines didn't even have uh, dilithium in them. Right. So they may have been one of the few species that were unaffected by, Is there, you know, the whole dilithium thing. But it makes you also wonder, couldn't they have taken advantage of that if they wanted to or... But then again, if they had reunited with the Vulcans, maybe the Vulcans were their better conscience and stopped them from doing it. But but anyway, I'm I'm really curious where that's going to go, and yeah. I think that we're going to see that. Well, that like I said, that's my that's my thought on that part of it. I yeah, I don't have a problem with it, unlike you guys, because I I have seen this kind of thing. Um, you know, all my life as, as have you guys in the two party system. And you'd be surprised when you say that, cause you guys know I'm Canadian, but in, in Canada, it's a three party system. Well, and, I'm libertarian. <laughs> okay. But, but still it's a three party system, but it's kind of like, um, you know, one party, one party's in the, on the right, one party's on the left and one party's in the middle. And, and, uh, you know, it, it, the, the party in the middle kind of shifts between the right and the left sometimes. So, um, and usually they're the ones that end up in power, but, but, uh, but it's still the same kind of thing. And what I've, what we've seen, what I've seen over time, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, we've seen the Federation has kind of been, you know, more, um, more libertarian, but also more liberal in, in its thought processes, but an external, you know, um, uh, catalyst causes a, an issue and it causes things to swing back over to, you know, this kind of like other, um, side of, of humans. And, you know, we saw that, like you said, we saw this in enterprise, like that whole, like, um, the, what was the, the name of the character played by Peter Weller? I can't think of it right now. Um, oh, uh, yeah. But anyway, um, you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. That that whole that whole like kind of isolationist kind of thing, and it's it doesn't surprise me that in this kind of situation that Earth would turn more inside and and um, I don't like the fact that they would become more you know treat treat like other, you know, almost, almost like Terran empire, like, you know, um, treat all, you know, other, other races as enemies kind of thing. But yeah, but, but we saw that, we saw that in Picard. Right. We did. So to an maybe, extent. Like I said, again, maybe that's another hook they're laying to kind of, to kind of lay the groundwork of what happened then it happened then it happened then. And we've had enough. So. And a lot of it is going to depend upon, like, why did this happen with dilithium? And is there something they're going to do about it? Or is there something that they're going to fix by going back in time? Or is there something they're going to do to fix it by, I don't know, like getting the spore technology out there so that they can go beyond dilithium and and just uh, take take things out that way, you know, make travel possible again and i don't know but they'll figure something out yeah but they, I, can't, they can't really use the mycelial network because they've already pissed off the uh i have the a feeling that they will they will figure that out well i got another theory they'll make the saucers uh the rotating saucers still widen them a little bit you know <laughs> <laughs> If you don't get that, <laughs> that was, that was how, that was how Voyager with its like tilt tilted, uh, nacelles, that's how they were able to extend the warp speed limit. And, you know, it's like, and, and they did something with, uh, enterprise make it, E to make, make it that a happen pizza too. Cutter. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, they'll, they'll do something like that to, uh, well, make it okay for the spores. I, th I think. If, if we're going to throw a theory, or do you want me to wait? Go ahead, no. Okay. See, my theory is it was something something about the dilithium that they had, and I think that 
you know, Discovery's got a bunch of prime new old stock dilithium that was theoretically unexposed to whatever made the burn happen. See, I'm thinking, I'm I'm going conspiracy theory angle that something happened in the process and that something was added to the mix. Oh, it's like uh, bad weed. I was going to I was going to say winter formulation the gas mm-hmm. brine. Mm-hmm. Okay. But that you know you've got this whole uh, I'll gripe about that later. But they've got all the old stock dilithium that they brought from the past that may not have the new additive that made it go bad. Oh yeah. So yeah. That's that's my feeling that they're going to that that's going to be part of it. It makes sense. Like if they try to, um, I don't know, stretch out the supply somehow and, uh, you know, so they, they did something to refine or. Well, it's like cutting your heroin with fentanyl. Exactly. Not that either of us know about that, but, but, <laughs> but, but anyway, don't the, laugh. The point, I, have, the, I have I have some professional dealing with that. Yeah, yeah, professional. You, forget, you, yes. you are a cop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, but still, that's what I was getting at. Is maybe yeah. the <laughs> and James falls off the table. But uh, maybe they cut something in. You could say maybe it was genetic modification. You know, like GMO food. Yeah, you sure. Know, I'm thinking they did something to stretch the supply when they saw they were running out, and you know. That's what went bad. We could always go with the angle of some nefarious force added something to make all the warp drives shut down. Yeah, it could be either thing. Like like you say, it could be it could be an external force. It could also be just a uh, you know. Or was somebody abusing? Refining- was somebody abusing Horta on a uh, on a mining <laughs> planet? Any anyone's guess. But it's, it's, I, but the the your your point's valid though. I think if they're trying to extend the uh, supplies, they could have done something in the refining process to make them I don't know less pure or something like that. The whole you know them go inert all at once though, it seems a little yeah. Well, janky. My only problem with them suddenly having a proliferation of spore drives is you still have to have a human navigator right which means you still have to have somebody with tardigrade dna and unless the well future, yeah ah, Unlo- the, you 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 get to the point i was yeah. going to make unless yeah. in the future they they have a way of creating a a non-human navigator that they couldn't do before so well, well there's that and you've already established that the that the that the actual entities that live in the mycelial network are already kind of pissed that we're invading the network. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, let's uh, let's move on. I think we're kind of being a dead horse here. Yes, so, yeah. Well, I just have <laughs> I just have one last thing, and maybe I'm just overly sensitive because of uh, the last few weeks of World Beyond, but. <laughs> Why'd it have to be snarky teenagers? <laughs> <laughs> Rather be snakes. <laughs> snarky yeah. teenagers. Why'd it have to be snarky teenagers? I, I don't know. Well, well, that was the only thing. I like the character. I like the way they held their own with Stamets. I'm going to be really excited to see how they hold out with Jet Reno. But yeah, there you go. Uh, but just the fact of, dang it, I almost broke into the sound of music. Uh, so you're 16 going on 17. <laughs> just not ready. Like I said, just not ready for more teenagers. Yeah, I I can identify with that. Um, so they're based on our shared our shared pain, which is uh, world beyond. Yep. So, all right. Well, I brought up the one point that I I had earlier already, but which I didn't actually have in my comments, and I should have. The biggest one I have is that 
I don't think that they sold this Burnham change enough for me. They talked about it. They, you know, she said she changed. We saw, you know, what she did, like not really communicating to Saru what she was going to do. That's one thing. So I guess you could, you could argue that, but I don't really see like how she's changed or why she's changed. So like it was just kind of based on a look or, you know, Oh, I've changed. Well, how have you changed? Why have you changed? Like, what was it about the year apart that made you change other than the conversation that she had with Giorgio where, you know, it's kind of like she had been, you know, this like human trained Vulcan, uh, in Starfleet kind of always doing what she was told of course, until she mutineered, <laughs> until she became a mutineer and, uh, you know, went against Giorgio. But the point being is that, you know, she was always kind of like following her logical end. So with Giorgio, you know, bringing that point up, I guess her being able to like being a, uh, a solo kind of like a, in a lot of ways, it reminded me of Mariner on Lower Decks, kind of like doing what she can. And uh, that kind of made me think that that's what it was. Like, it's she's not really, ne- like, she'll do what's necessary. It's almost like a Section 31 thing, you know, doing what it takes to get the job done, but not necessarily following the the orders of, of Starfleet or the you know, the principles of Starfleet, but I, I tend to think that she's going to get there and she'll probably, I don't know. I, I could still see her be a uh, captain at, at some point in this series, like later, later on, I think Saru is the right captain at, for the time, but I could see her becoming a uh, captain at some point, you know, once she kind of like you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you have to get all of the traits, whereas before she was too Vulcanish, and, you know, so she's got to get a little bit of more of the swashbuckling and now she's got that, but now she's like too far over. So she needs to come back a little bit. Yeah. I, I, they just didn't sell it enough. No, they didn't sell it enough. So that's my take. They need to explain it more. Maybe they had more exposition there. And because they had as much exposition as they had, they didn't want to like overwhelm us with it. But this is a thing where I think, like, it's like, why did she let them go? You know, I, I mean, did she, I, I don't know. So, so there's that. The next one, um, cause this really bugged me. They had this meeting with this captain from the United Earth, you know, and they go to Pike's ready room. And in Pike's ready room is a broken table, right? Why are they having a meeting in that room with the broken table? Like, how are they going to explain the broken table? And worse, they don't explain the broken table. And the captain from United Earth says nothing about it. Like, that was just weird to me. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, you've done all these repairs on the ship. You've gotten the dot sevens to do all their dot 70 sort of things but you can't get anybody to replicate a new board or two to fix the table and, or at least, or at least put it in the closet. And the thing is, and the thing is, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, they've been on this long journey or whatever they, that's, that's what they're selling. And so why do they have this broken table? It, it made no sense to me. It really took me out of the moment when I, when I went back and I, I, I really noticed this. <laughs> What's that? I wanted to know why it was broken. <laughs> well, we saw it. We saw it last episode that it was broken, but you know, well, yeah, we saw it was broken, but we don't right. know why it was broken. Right. That's right. I, that's. I was like, why is the table broke? Yeah. You know, did they did they have a uh a, a was there a table match in the ready room? Uh, <laughs> did, did something fall on it when they were going through the wormhole? Yeah, maybe. 
or uh, extra G forces or something. Yeah. But, I, but I, I was, I was certain. I mean, I, 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 I was, I said the same thing. I was like, what happened to the table? And yeah, it was because the rest of the room looked fine. But that's my point though, is that, okay. So the table was broken, but why didn't they fix the table? Like, <laughs> Or get they're, rid of it. They're trying to have, like, <laughs> they're trying to have this meeting with this Earth representative, and they're trying to to come up with the story that they've been on a long journey. Why have they had this long journey with a broken table? You know, and this is before they they fire on them, right? This is before that. The, this this is not like before they take a bunch of big shots. This is before. So they can't say, well, you know, this, this happened because you guys shot at us. No, this happened before that we have this broken table and it's a tradition. We have, it's called the broken table room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This was the broken table of our founder. Yeah. Anyway, it, it didn't make sense to me. It, it was really distracting and I could see them having a broken table in episode two and I could even see them having a broken table in episode three, not have a broken table with somebody you're trying to tell them that, you know, you've been on this long journey that it just doesn't make sense to me at all. The last thing, and this, this is a nitpicky thing, but it's a, it's a major nitpicky thing. Scotty, when he was on TNG in the episode relics, He's introduced to Synth the Hall. He doesn't know what the hell Synth the Hall is, right? They mentioned Synth the Hall. You know, he's like, oh, Synth the Hall. And I remember um, the, what was it, the Bring Lloydy. I remember he didn't remember what Synth the Hall, but I, if I remember correctly, and maybe I'm wrong, if I, I'll go back to uh, Relics and I'll confirm this. And if, I, if I'm wrong, I will, I'll do like I did last, uh, the other episode the other day. So it's either going to be if I'm wrong or. So you'll either hear an incorrect or you hear a ding, 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 if I'm correct. But what I remember is that Scotty didn't know what synth the hall was. I believe you're right. I uh, believe you're right. True. Yeah. I, so why did they have synth the hall on discovery? That was roughly 10 years before the enterprise. And, you know, when even before that, like, like this is many years past that, uh, mm-hmm. Scotty. So it, anyway, that, maybe, that was maybe a, the sphere. <laughs> that was continuity gaff though. Yeah, yep. Pretty big one. Okay. So now it's time for our hold your horses segment. Hello, this is captain Tilly. What the heck? Heck hell. What the hell? Hold your horses. Hold your horses. And some people are still, you know, mentioning these as not good enoughs. We'll let them mention it as not good enough. But again, it's a not good enough is a hold your horses. They're the same. So, yeah. and if you have minor gripes, I guess they should go in the feedback. So <laughs> we'll have to remember that for next time. I thought about that while I was editing. Because we're not making another category. You got it right. You and LT, you now know it's it's a pain in the butt when you're trying to get the feedback together, having to like shuffle everything around in in all these categories. It's a pain. So that's or we'll why over the trash. No, we don't want to throw anything in the trash. I'm but, kidding. <laughs> but anyway, it, anything that doesn't quite fit in the three categories goes in the feedback. That that's the simplest goes. Okay, so we've got um, quite a few things here from Comic Geek Kev. Some he has called not good enoughs, and some he has called hold your horses. So we'll start with the not good enoughs. And James, why don't you start with those? All right. Comic Geek Kev says, I found it a bit of a stretch that with technology a thousand years more advanced, that Earth didn't know that when was human or that there was, wasn't was some way to communicate to Earth to begin with to avoid them destroying that first ship the colony sent. Yeah. I mean, I talked about this already. Uh, it should have been a way to send a distress signal, and it should have been a, there should have been a way for Earth to realize that that was a distress signal. And for that matter, 
how could they fly to Earth but not send a distress signal? That makes no sense to me at all. Like, I, I don't know. Moving on. And moving on, Burnham and Book discussing their past exploits were a bit too cutesy. I honestly don't need to know much about the year she was alone with him unless it helps move the story along. It reminded me of a couple who are trying too hard to prove to people how much they know about each other. Mm. Oh, comic geek Kev. See, this is what I like about these two. <laughs> All right. What was it that Tilly was touching right after the opening credits? Were those badges from the crew they lost or left behind? I couldn't read anything on the ones that seemed to have writing on them because it did seem like they were like name tags underneath the badges. While it's good to see that they're still acknowledging whatever might be happening with Detmer, I hope it doesn't drag out too long. I'm curious to see what's going on, but I'd also like to see the other bridge crew get some attention. I'm wondering if they may come under serious fire or some other kind of trouble, and her inability to act causes major problems. Significant damage, boarding by enemies, enemies, etc. Yeah. Oh, that's still one. When Ndoye was contacted, she said, a view screen. How quaint. Yes, I, I remember that. What was she expecting? A hologram? Bookship well, seemed to have a... I, I was going to say, though, God, God. I wondered about this. Like, did, did, um, did Pike remove the holograms from Discovery as well? Because we know we know that he had them removed from Enterprise, but did he have them removed from Discovery? I didn't think so. No, he didn't. He just didn't use them, right? And maybe Saru just out of habit followed suit. Yeah, yeah. It's never explained. Or the writers know don't use holograms because the fans don't like it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's retcon that real quick. <laughs> okay. So he goes on to say, Bookship seemed to have a view screen too, doesn't it? It looks different, but isn't it still a view screen? Yeah. It seemed to have a little bit of information around it, though. Maybe it was a little bit of inf like an informative view screen. I don't know. Yeah. More, more, like a, more like a HUD. <laughs> Wes from Minnesota says, not enough Adira and Stamets. I can't wait to see these two characters progress through the season together. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a lot of her. I mean, I, I don't know. There, there was, there wasn't enough of her for me to form a major opinion of her, to be honest. So I look forward to uh, seeing more of her character because I'm, I'm interested, but there wasn't a lot there. So, you know, that's my take. So I guess I agree with you. I guess that's the, that's the, the long version. And the short one is, uh, I agree. Uh, Rick from Cleveland has our last, um, hold your horses, which he calls not good enough. He has two. He says, my first not good enough is Detmer actually arguing with Saru during the conflict in earth orbit. Maybe this is part of a larger issue we think could be coming with Detmer, but she seemed to be well out of the fog she was in last week. Her arguing a direct order in the midst of a crisis is out of character. Let Giorgio have the argument with Saru, not a subordinate. I would agree with that. And, you know, I think they're certainly hinting that there's an issue with her and it could be PTSD and it could be something else. I know some other podcasts have wondered if she has been like corrupted by control. I do not think so. I think, I think we're done with control. Um, I don't want to see control here, but um, no, we're, we're not, we're seeing, like it makes sense that there'd be people that would be just having, having issues like, you know, um, caught out of time, you know, you know, uh, like all their, 
it, like uh, Tilly mentions about like all of her family and friends are, you know, gone and she's got no idea to know what happened to them and all that stuff. So it's feeling more like PTSD to me. It, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think so. And maybe, you know, she'll have some kind of moment, you know, later that will kind of show that. But I don't know. I, I like the fact that they're getting her more time. Um, we've wanted to see that. I think we're getting more time from the, the bridge crew. So that's good. My other not good enough is this whole theme of Burnham having changed in the year she was with Book. There is no allusion to a traumatic experience, but the writers want us to believe that Michael, who has been monitoring her communicator for a year, has a hard time being a Starfleet officer. After all, she went through in season one and two. I think that was a bit tough to believe. You know, I got to say, Rick, um, you kind of hit the nail on the head with this one. Um, that that's kind of where I'm at too with it is that they're, they're trying to sell this whole thing about it being changed and it just doesn't feel earned to me. There, there just hasn't been enough there to show me how she's been changed. And, and yeah, it's like, can consider what she went through in season one, you know, she was sentenced to mutiny, um, you know, stripped of rank, you know, went through all this other stuff. Um, in season two had to time travel and found out her mom was a time traveler, wasn't dead for 20 years, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, now she's got a hard time. Like it's just, I don't, it doesn't ring true to me. It, it, this is where it feels like, um, we're seeing the seams of, of the, of the story. So, you know, the character is acting a certain way to satisfy the story, and not that the the story is acting away because of the character. Um, now, if we had seen some kind of events that would have created that, then I, I would believe it. But I don't believe it based on what we've seen so far. So there's there's nothing traumatic. There's nothing. Like she she hasn't. There's no PTSD there. It's more of a. I don't know. It's like you've moved on from a from a, a a relationship, and and that person suddenly back in your life, and you know that that's what it seems like to me. You know, I can go with that. Okay, well that's yeah, that's it for our uh, hold your horses. So we've got some for us. So James, why don't you start us off? All right. So so my hold your horses. To be honest, uh, my initial response was her as a human having a symbiote was I forgot about Riker having a symbiote on TNG. So I was like, oh, my God, a human has a symbiote. What, what's going on here? And then I remembered Riker. So scratch that. Although they knew about Trill. Yeah. So Riker did mention something about sphere data. So... I was a little bit confused about that. So did the sphere data mention Trill because uh you mean Trill, Saru, Trill Saru mentioned sphere data. Oh, said oh, Sar- oh my apologies. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I, I I thought Michael mentioned sphere data. Okay. No. But the, but uh Saru mentioned sphere data, but uh so uh, Saru mentioned sphere data, but the uh, Trill wasn't discovered until TNG. Right. So how would they have known about Trill? Um, so. Well, no, I mean, no, that's not, that's not true. Um, they didn't know a lot about the Trill. So the Trill well, were kind of mysterious, but the Trill had been right. around. But they didn't know about the symbiotes. Right. Right. And that could have just been, it could have been that this was a known thing, you know, but the people on the enterprise didn't know about it. You know, maybe yeah, it's kind of like a know. top secret thing or something, you know, who yeah. knows? I guess. I don't know. Cause, cause just... if you think about it, if you think about it, if everybody knows that the trail have the symbiont that puts a target on them, you know, like if you needed to kill the ambassador, um, you know, you, you could, you could simply do it by, you know, 
going after the host or going, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like there there's, it, yeah. it, it adds a special. And the other thing, you know, killing the symbiote kills the host. That's yeah. the other thing. True. I don't know. I, I don't know. To me, it's just, it's, it seems like, I don't know. It, it just seemed like a bit of a retcon to me. I don't know. It was, yeah. I don't know. It, it was, it was a bit of a hold your horses to me kind of situation. Yep. Yep. I would agree. But, uh, uh, I'll agree. Yeah. And then, and then to me, that the, that were situation they really really played it up last episode and then just like a couple hours later she's back at the con and really really just kind of playing just i mean she's a little bit argumentative but just kind of back at things and maybe a little bit argumentative or what have you but i mean PTSD, concussion, what have you, if it's just a concussion, that's not concussion symptoms. You know, I've, I've had a few concussions over the years. That's not concussion. That's and and PTSD. I don't know. I mean, it's that, that whole thing. I, I really like her character and I think they can do more with it. And I, I hope they choose to explore what's going on with her more. And I, I feel like her arc was really left out of this episode and I hope they pick it up more next episode. Okay. And I can agree with that. Yeah. And, I, it, and it, I'll, it just, I'll, I'll carp about it. It's, in it, my it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just something where it was, it was barely touched on and it, and it's, 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 it's something to me that I, I, I just think the, the way, the way they really focused on it, they they really need to focus on it more. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. LT, what do you have? All right. My Hold Your Horses was the big vending machine of dilithium in the ship. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it did look like that, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's like either the, either the Coke machines that have the where you see the bottles and the little thing comes up and trolleys it over to the edge or it's absolutely left me, but there was some spy movie with a big spiral index of stuff. Uh, I'm kind of going, how much dilithium do they need? Yeah. That, you know, I'm thinking, well, how much dilithium did Scotty have? Because when they had the situation where, it was a TOS episode. The dilithium crystals were cracked or broken or burned out or whatever, and they didn't have spares, so they couldn't go. And I'm thinking, oh yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, criminy. How much dilithium? You know, how many spares are they carrying? That they've got a whole big, you know, vendomatic tray of it, <laughs> or that they're they're willing to use it as uh, some sort of bargaining chip. And I'm thinking, well, you better not get rid of what, what you've got. And then of course they got plenty. So yeah. that, that's a, that's a requires some horse holding for me. Uh, we already touched on it, but you know, where's non? Yeah. You know, well, you've got a security threat to your boat and, Where's the security chief? You know, are her and Colbert and Jet down in the break room eating tapioca? Or, you know, it's like that. That, like I said, that was that's my thing. Where's my security chief? And I, my gripe about Detmer is she was insubordinate in a crisis. You know, the captain was saying you know, do this, do this. And she's like, but sir. And I'm thinking ah, any other ship, it would have been, you're relieved. Somebody else jump in the chair. Uh, I hope like I, we've already, we've already beat on that horse and I won't beat on it anymore, but I really hope it's something that is a compelling character development point rather than the super obvious one. Oh, well, she's got control in her, little implanty thing or we're going to have some oh well her implant didn't handle the time shift well and it's degrading and yeah you know, 
give me something, you know, just g- give me something I can, I can hold on to and not just some, you know, you're talking about seeing the seams. My, th- this is to me, this is kind of like seeing the background operator in a Kabuki theater show or seeing the arm of the puppeteer. Uh, I just, it seems a little too contrived. I, I'm hoping that the, that they're gonna, you know, come through with the story. Give me something good with it. Yeah. Well, here's my theory. I was gonna leave this in feedback, but I I decided to move it up. So, we know that the Federation Starfleet whatever has moved off of Earth. We don't know where they are we assume that it still exists somewhere. So let's assume that it does. So according to just bring it up here, article 14, section 31 of the Starfleet charter says that, uh, allowed for extraordinary measures to be taken in times of extreme threat. That's how section 31 was built. This whole thing with uh, dilithium going inert seems to me an extreme threat to the Federation. So what could possibly happen? Maybe Section 31 in all of its, you know, trying to preserve the Federation takes charge and uh, does what it can to preserve the Federation. So it turns from like being a malevolent kind of you know shady kind of thing to preserving the the federation to be the preservers so that makes me think that perhaps the keepers of the federation slash starfleet are section 31 (laughs) furthermore this makes me think that perhaps we have thought that it was going to be a certainty that sometime this season Giorgio would be leaving the show and time traveling back to the 23rd century or somewhere else where she would take over or be a part of section 31 and i'm starting to wonder if no when they find section 31 maybe she's going to take over or be a part of that section 31 in the 32nd century. So maybe the section 31 show and the reason why they haven't talked about it at all is because it is actually in the 32nd century. And it's going to be a companion show to discover. And it's exactly. in the future and it hasn't happened yet. Exactly. So they can't talk about it because, because it would have been a, a spoiler to this show. So, that this is what I'm thinking. This is why we haven't heard anything about this show. It's because they couldn't talk about it because it's actually 32nd century section 31. Ooh. Although P- pin another five quad lose to the bulletin board boys. <laughs> <laughs> Although isn't, uh, isn't Ash Tyler, isn't Ash Tyler supposed to be in it though? There is nothing that says that he is. That he's confirmed. Oh. No, no, oh. there, but but he could he could totally be in strange new worlds i mean that that would yeah. make total sense so okay. so you know and maybe maybe as full time character maybe as a recurring who knows but okay. um but there's nothing to say that he couldn't be in that show but like if you think about the fact if you if you like um decouple the idea of Giorgio in the 23rd century, because if you think about it, why would she want to go back? No, right? she wouldn't. Right. So it, it makes, it makes more sense to me that this section 31 show is in 3189. Or, and she and already not, said she likes it here. Exactly. Yeah, well, it's, it's anarchy and yeah. What, what better place to be than anarchy? Right. Her. And, and to her, you know, like if she's a, you know, it comes from tyrannical, you know, establishing order, <laughs> her order, you know, may be a thing. And, but if she's, you know, if she's been like turned over to the good, you could still like be like that, but still do good, you know, like your um, lawful, 
you know, she becomes lawful good versus lawful evil, you know, that kind of thing. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. She would, she would never be lawful. Okay. It would be, it would be more, more chaotic. Good. Well, I thought, yeah, true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll bring, you know, Ash back as a uh, computer generated, uh, or maybe a descendant of Ash he'll, Tyler. Anyway. He'll be the emergency holographic Klingon double agent. <laughs> or he'll be the, you know, um, whatever they call angels and Klingon. <laughs> great, 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 great grandson. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. There's another thing. But yeah, anyway, that that's my big uh, revelation. So I, I don't. I don't know if that's what we're going to get, but, um, I, I got a, I got a big signal towards that this week. I like it. Yeah. It Um, it fits as good as any. The other thing, and I don't have it written down, but it's, I guess it's worth saying that the talk about like the seams again, the, the scene where, or scenes where you know, Saru and Burnham kind of negotiate or help negotiate between, um, the earth captain and, um, when it just seemed a little, almost too Starfleety to, to me. Um, it just seemed like, like really it, that. And that's why I said earlier that you really couldn't get a message out like all this, all this way. Like, you know, to send a bottle over to <laughs> a proverbial bottle from, from Titan to, uh, to earth and say, Hey, uh, anyway, the point, it, it, if, if this was a planet or something that was, you know, further, further over, it, it would make more sense. Uh, but it being Titan, you would think that sensors would tell them what was going on Titan. You know, all right. Well, anyway, let's move on. We've been going pretty long, I think. Um, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, let's move on and go to our feedback section and open hailing frequencies again. Okay. So we have a voicemail from Jeff X force 11. Hello, Brian, Ruthie, and Star Trek fans. This is Jeff X Force 11 leaving my feedback about people of Earth. I really appreciated that we got to start to explore the dynamic between the Discovery crew who has been here for just a short amount of time and Michael, who has been here for a year struggled, fought, developed this relationship with Book, and really sought to make this time her own when she didn't really know if she'd get to see Discovery again. And I like that we're going to continue this process to grow through it, as Saru says. So I'm really appreciating that. I'm looking forward to the fact that we are going to get to see some changes in Philippa of her being this mom to Michael of interviewing the boyfriend and things like that. I really, I'm looking forward to that. And so I'm excited about this season and how we're going to get to see some new storytelling techniques. Thanks to this time jump. All right. Those are my thoughts. X-Force 11 is out. Well, thank you so much, Jeff X-Force 11 for your, feedback this week good to hear from you again and uh keeping up that streak (laughs) so what would you think of uh what jeff had to say anything yeah i think i think i think he's made some good points see what happens i would agree james you don't have anything to say i'm also in agreement okay one of the other one of the other members now from the Carolina contingent. Yes, <laughs> actually, we heard we heard uh, from I think three of you this week. Well, you LT for being here, and I think we also heard from John. He's also from uh, North Carolina. Um. Okay. So 
we've got our second voicemail. Of course, that's from our good friend, Fred from the Netherlands. And of course, Fred, got to thank you again for getting in your feedback. I know that it's difficult for you, you know, because you don't have as much time as the rest of us. But anyway, here is your voicemail. Hello, Brian and Ruthie and all listeners to Talk True Media. This is Fred from the Netherlands with some feedback for Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 3. Okay, it's already Friday evening, 10.30, and I just saw the episode together with my wife, so a very short feedback, and perhaps it's still in time. Beautiful episode, especially visuals, the close-ups, and music, a lot of slow talking, I don't know how to say it differently, emotional discussions between almost everybody, between George Yu and Michael, between Saru and Michael, between Book and Michael, between Tilly and Michael. On the other hand, perhaps a little bit too much of that. I was wondering last podcast what we would uh, experience from Michael's past in the in the last year. And he, we got some answers. So what they do is they use just teasing between Booker and, and Michael and all kinds of adventures that they had together were referenced, although we only half know what they did together. But it shows a kind of in- intimacy they had in probably not love relationship or sexual but at least as big big buddies kind of buddies in crime of course a nice twist that these raiders were actually also humans and that talking always helps stamets is making a connection to this earth girl with the trill symbiont i wonder what his relationship with her will be will it be the same as with tilly and how will this influence the relationship between tilly uh, and this girl or will this intervene in the relationship between tilly and stamets that there will be a kind of jealousy perhaps even okay that was a very short feedback all for now greetings all the best fred from the netherlands Well, thank you so much, Fred, for your voicemail. Again, good to hear from you. And hope everything is good in the Netherlands. (laughs) But yes, thank you for getting in the feedback in a timely way. Yeah, emotional discussions. There was a lot of that this, this week. I mean, I can see some of it being there, of course, because, you know, they had been apart And of course, it had not nearly been as long for the Discovery crew as it had been for uh, Burnham, you know? So I don't know what that would be like if you were in that kind of situation. I mean, they were kind of in the reverse situation before, a long time ago, well, in first season when they were in the Mirror Universe and they came back and nine months had passed. Um, But anyway... I think some of it made sense, um, but like I said, a lot of it I, I don't think was adequately explained, and I think they need to do a better job of explaining it. So, what do you guys think? No, no, I think I like I, I think we've we've come close to well. Okay. All right. So again, Fred, thank you so much for your feedback. So. Let's move on. We've got some written feedback now. And first is um, Comic Geek Kev with his written feedback that doesn't fit into a, one of the yeses, nos, or hold your horses. So, James. Uh, all right. Comic Geek Kev says, another enjoyable episode. To me, it wasn't quite as good as the first two of the season, but they were a lot to stack up against. The whole burn slash Federation mystery is pretty compelling stuff to me. I don't know if the season is going to be split up into a couple of major storylines, but I could see this lasting the season. If you include trying to rebuild the Federation and find a way for them, or as far as we know, at least Giorgio to get back to their time. I'm not always a fan of the voiceover at the beginning of the episodes, but I think it was well done here as a bridge between Burnham's experience and, and the finding of discovery. I like Ndoye and I'm hoping to see more of her, but it doesn't sound like that's in the cards. I also like Adira. Glad to see her join the crew. 
from what I've read, it sounds like the character will be going on a discovery of her own. One of the things I really like about the show more than the other treks is how they seem to be so close. The other shows are close crew members, but I feel like the creators here are trying for, for more of a, of a friend or family dynamic. Maybe it's just me, but I get a totally different vibe than on other shows. And I love it till next time. All right. Thank you. Okay. Got some feedback from Ken from Chicago who says cake is eternal thumbs up and not sure what that rolling on the floor, laughing and Spock emoji. I was getting to the Spock emoji, James. I was looking at the other one. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks dad. (laughs) And it's also worth mentioning that it didn't copy over from Twitter, but Ken from Chicago, of course, has a, a GIF which has Khan and, or sorry, uh, James E. Kirk saying, you know, Khan, but it, the the uh, the caption says cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we got one from, I guess, at TD Schwartzberg. Yep. Also it's, Twitter. Yep. It's not on IMDb. But in hashtag Star Trek Discovery episode three, number three, people of Earth, Dilithium Raider Wynn's helmet is removed by George Yu on the reveal of a human played by Christopher Heyerdahl, right? Yep. That's the guy uh, and the actor's name that you were trying to remember before. So. The Swede. The Swede. And Clint from Indianapolis says nine out of ten Admiral Giorgio's. It's the second week in a row of Hell on Wheels alumni the Swede. Hopefully we'll see more of him. And like I said before, yes, let's see some more. Cool. Mike from the internet and uh, like Clint's, uh, Clint's came in while we were recording. Mike's also came in while we were recording. Uh, He says a nine and a half out of 10. I like how they seem to be spacing out storylines such as Detmers and Burnham's. They're not trying to wrap everything up in one or two episodes. Second, they are hitting all of the sentimental buttons in this one. I loved the reunion scene, Michael and Tilly reconnecting, and Saru and Michael reestablishing their connection as well. Yeah, you know, I I like those scenes, um, especially like the one uh, at the end where uh, Michael just, you know, kind of, Stays with Saru. Thought that was good. Um, Michael endorsing Saru for captain was a plus. Philippa gave us insight into Michael with her usual arrogant yet incisive attitude. Adira brings more mystery and intrigue. A noticeable absence of jet. Boo. There you go, James. Someone agrees with you. (laughs) But a win in the diplomacy column for starfleet by episodes end overall this episode hit me in the feels all right well thank you so much mike um let's uh go to our other notes do we have any other notes james well i I had one more note okay they removed the solar panels from the golden gate bridge oh yeah did they okay makes sense see them yeah, they weren't there. Yeah, me and LT were discussing that earlier. Oh, okay, cool. What about you, LT? I think we've pretty well beat the wheels off of anything we could have mentioned here. Okay, so um, I did have one thing that I wanted to bring up about the episode that didn't really fit anywhere else, and that is that the uniforms that the United Earth defense force had reminded me of babylon five and uh of course they had the earth alliance and um somewhat they were somewhat similar to what the psychops wore in on babylon five um they had like kind of a similar um like badge worn in a different spot but they also had like this these kind of straps that went down you know similar colors like dark colors i think that was more black but uh anyway it reminded me of that 
we have already gone through all our notes and there are some things that I wanted to say, but they're in our next section, which is spot the references slash 47. And yet again, I used an article from uh, denofgeek.com. So there'll be a link to it on the Facebook group and in the blog post. So, uh, well, finally, after some, you know, yearning for them, we got an actual 47. And that was when Burnham as a courier right in the cold open, uh, is seen taken some kind of, I don't know, it almost looks like a thumb drive or something, uh, from this one person with a glove on. Um, I, I don't, I think he was alien, but I don't remember what kind of alien, but it says on there, we see, uh, NCC four, seven, seven, four. So, <laughs> so both a four, seven and a seven, four. And of course, Ruthie always says that the seven fours don't count. It's but, a palindrome. Yes. But it seems like there may have been another digit after that, uh, from the looks of it. So, you know, it could have been four, seven, seven, four, seven, who knows, but anyway, um, so there's that, uh, Burnham's opening narration fills in with new details about the burn of course. Um, so we don't know much about the 30th century in existing Trek canon, uh, other than, uh, Daniels had from the enterprise had some knowledge of that era, but it, it would come to think, you know, if like the temporal cold war turned into the temple temporal war, that would probably happen in the 31st century. So, you know, some things like with dilithium drying up in the 30th century, that would kind of, I guess, kind of make sense. Um, so that could have been the start of uh, what got the temporal war going. And for all we know, it may have led to it, uh, or the, the dilithium stuff may have led to it. Or should I say the dilithium could have been a part of the temporal war or could have been the result of the temple temporal war or whatever. Uh, and they also mentioned about trialing alternative warp designs, warp drive designs. And, you know, we don't, we don't know too much about that either. Um, but we do know about the speed limit thing, which we mentioned before. And, um, the, I mentioned earlier about like quantum singularity, um, and how that po powers a Romulan vessel, whether it, they use dilithium. I've never heard one way or the other. I'm not sure how Borg vessel is propulsed. If that's a word. Well, we know that they use transwarp conduits. So, you know, we even seen, seen that used in Picard. So there's that, uh, Burnham mentions to Saru that, um, they had never heard of her mom at all. So whether or not, I mean, maybe she's going incognito, uh, maybe she, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of things that that could be, or maybe she arrived there, uh, further ahead. I don't know, but I guess if she was tethered back to that, uh, time, you would, you would think that, you know, she would have been like at, I don't know, 3168, I yeah, guess. She got sucked through the vortex without a suit on. That's the other thing. Yeah. 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 And we had talked about that. Also, uh, we see discovery being repaired by dot seven robots a little bit. Uh, spoiler, we're going to see them again next episode. Um, but we see them a little bit on the enterprise in, uh, such sweet sorrow part two. So, and we know that they're going to factor in somehow because we see them on the, um, in the credits sequence, we see what looked like dot sevens. Um, 
Giorgio mentions gallivanting through space with Michael. Um, it could be a reference to Kirk gallivanting around the cosmos is a game for the young. Um, planet Saturn was has been not mentioned very often in Star Trek, but we see it, of course, in The Best of Both Worlds. Uh, it plays in the first duty. In fact, Titan also plays in the first duty because um, the Colvard Starburst thing that uh, Crusher gets in trouble for. And what's his name? Nicholas Lacano, also known as Tom Paris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was supposed to be around Titan. So um, then there's the whole I.I. commander that Booker says to Burnham that was apparently uh, mentioned by Lavelle to Riker in the episode Lower Decks. And Riker says, one eye is sufficient acknowledgement, Ensign. So tied to that. Um, the idea of a generational ship, um, we've seen that before. Actually, we've seen that a couple of times before. Um, in the Enterprise episode E squared or E2, that was... Um, we see the enterprise like, and their descendants. Of course, one of them is actually not a descendant, but to Paul, uh, just way older. Um, we see that, uh, we've also seen the episode from deep space nine season five called children of time. And that's where the defiant crash lands on a planet in the gamma quadrant. And they meet up with the descendants of the defiant and uh, Odo's still there, if you recall. Um, this the whole thing about synthetol we we mentioned before, and um, Book was furious to find out he's drinking synthetol. And um, it says, according to uh, Dan of Geek, to be clear, in Trek canon, synthetol can get you drunk, but mostly if you're an alien or a former Borg. In the TNG episode Relics, Scotty complained about having to drink Synthahol in 10 forward. So this is where I need to go back and determine um, that that whole thing, whether he knew about it or not. Uh, it's mentioned that uh, Re Wens Raiders have quantum torpedoes, which we've seen, of course. Um, Enterprise had them. Uh, I think Voyager had them, too. Giorgio suggests Saru take swift and aggressive action. Um, and of course, uh, her, his response to her is Starfleet does not fire first, which was something that prime Giorgio said to Burnham in the first episode, the Vulcan hello. So that was kind of a cool kind of thing. Um, of course, trill stuff. We see Giorgio's telescope, which we know that was given to originally given to Burnham, and then Burnham gave it to to Saru. But he takes out the telescope, and they um, look at the Earth. I guess Is that what they were looking at. Also, uh, Burnham says the book that he has a fresh start in a new quadrant. So we know that Earth is in the Alpha quadrant. So does that mean that? book was in the beta quadrant or gamma or delta for that matter. Uh, we see a lot of the Starfleet Academy stuff that we've seen before. Um, apparently that big tree was mentioned in past episodes, like the drum head and the game. And, uh, but we see, you know, we see that, same we've seen a similar spot of Starfleet Academy. And I think that's not actually in South San Francisco. That's across the Bay. Is that not true? And I think that's it. So let's move on to our ship wide announcements. First up about this episode, I guess it's really about the ready room. Uh, they had actually a pretty full episode of the ready room because they had multiple guests on there. Uh, Jonathan Frakes, of course, who directed the episode, was on there, and uh, Bo Young, Young Kim, and Erica Lipolt, the writers of it, were there, as was the composer from Star Trek Discovery, Jeff Russo. And uh, that was pretty cool 
there was a lot of cool discussion on there. Uh, I liked the discussion that uh, Will Wheaton had with Jeff Russo about how much they geek out about getting to how how he how much he geeks out about writing music. How much of a Star Trek fan he was. I didn't realize that uh, he was that much of a Star Trek fan. And Jonathan Frakes had a great story about, and I'm going to get her name wrong. I apologize. Fumzile Satole. I don't know if it's right. Who played Nadoye. Apparently she was close to retirement. Like basically this was going to be her last audition. She had been not getting anywhere with her acting and was just going to, you know, she was done. So she, uh, she got the part. And, um, when Jonathan, you know, after they were done, he sent like a message of thanks and she told him that, you know, thank you so much. And it meant so much to her that, um, she decided to, you know, keep her, um, SAG card and all that stuff. So she's, you know, still in the union and still, you know, so it, it, uh, restored her, uh, confidence and her, um, passion for it. So that's a great story. All right. So we have our news now and, uh, I want to thank Wes from Minnesota. Uh, for collecting these, Wes Huntington. Amazon and CBS have teamed up starting in November for Star Trek Month. I had not heard this before. Get exclusive deals for comics, uh, physical recent physical media releases like Picard Season 1 and the like. So I remember I had seen something, so, uh, a page or something, but I didn't know it was like a whole month deal thing. That's kind of cool. Aaron Waltke, a producer from Star Trek Prodigy, uh, who's worked with the Hagerman brothers before the co-creators of Star Trek Prodigy, said he is putting hope and optimism into the Nickelodeon series. Tawny Newsom, who plays Mariner on Lower Decks, uh, has released her first musical album, and it's titled Material Flats. And of course, she's also one of the co-hosts of the pod directive, Star Trek, the pod directive, uh, which is actually turning into a pretty good podcast. Um, it's not so much like, you know, talk about the episode. It's more like interview type, uh, stuff. Talk to me about Star Trek type thing. So that's kind of cool. Longtime author James Swallow is penning a Star Trek Picard novel called the dark veil. And it's set to feature Troy Riker and the crew of the Titan. Speaking of Titan, <laughs> following following the synth attack on Utopia Planitia, and it will supposedly be released in the first week of January 2021. Since we're talking about books, it's worth mentioning that this week, um, on Tuesday the 27th, the book the autobiography of Catherine Janeway was released. And that of course was written by Una McCormack. And we had her, uh, on a previous episode of, uh, the Star Trek Picard cast. I think it was episode 16 where she, w we interviewed her specifically talking about the last best hope, but, uh, she was, she talked a little bit about writing that book. So it's good. That's out now. So you can, you can get it. It's available on Amazon. Lastly is discovery ratings. Um, it got a 0 0.2 in the 18 to 49 with 1.368 million viewers. And that is the, um, and that is down from the rating from two weeks ago, because of course it was preempted last week because of the presidential debate. It got a 0 0.3 in the 18 to 49 with 1.815 million viewers two weeks ago. So I think this is a classic example of it being off a week and people forget, you know, so that's probably why. And lastly, Parrot Analytics uh, has uh, its numbers out for this week. And in the digital originals, Star Trek Discovery went up a point to number five in total average demand expressions. At 37.4 times the average. So number one this week is the Mandalorian, which is not unexpected with the fact that it just came out again. 
Uh, and but the the difference between Star Trek and and the Mandalorian is not that much, like in comparison, uh, thirty seven point four so versus th- sixty three point seven. But I imagine that that number is going to go quite a bit higher for next week. Okay, so that's it. To submit your theories and feedback, go to talkthroughmedia.com forward slash feedback, where you can submit text or audio. You can call our voicemail line, which is 216-232-6146. You can also leave us an email at Star Trek Discovery at talkthroughmedia.com. Or, like most people, you can post on our designated episode thread in the Facebook group. That's at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. And the deadline for the deadline for Star Trek discovery season three, episode four will be at our regular day and time, which is changing this week because of the clocks go back an hour Friday, November 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, and it's midnight UTC. So our Twitter handle is at Star Trek TTM, as our is our Instagram and our TikTok. But you can also also add me at Instagram. That's at B-R-I-A-N-M-E-L-O-C-H-E at both Instagram and TikTok. Our networks Facebook page is at facebook.com forward slash talk through media, where you can actually write a review about the podcast and the network. And from there, we share our posts about the episodes when they come out. So share those posts when they come out. And that is a good way to get the word that the episodes are out. Subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts or the podcast client of your choice. And while you're there, give us a rating review. And there's also Podchaser at podchaser.com and many different podcast clients use that for uh, ratings reviews. And with Podchaser, you can also rate individual episodes. There's also Patreon. And uh, unfortunately, with Ruthie's um, power outage, we were unable to schedule a Patreon for, uh, October. We had hoped to do one for this weekend, but we're going to have to push that back, but we will do be doing one, uh, soon in November, but we will be, for those of you that are on Patreon and LT and James are two of the Patreon members. Um, they know, (laughs) and they're, Actually, I'm recording this after the fact, but um, they know what it's like. It's basically more of a roundtable kind of uh, version of the podcast, so everybody gets a talk. Uh, But anyway, we'll be talking about Discovery, and we'll probably have another episode done, and we'll probably also mention Lower Decks and maybe some other stuff. But I'd like to thank our Patreon members, Clint McCollum, Lawrence Todd, James Robbins, Fred Petrie, Cal McAdams, Kim Vogley, Brian Shiro, Christoph Lechtleitner, Lee Radke, Aaron Mays, Michael Carrier, Stephen Chambers, Kevin Lyle, Jeff Gentry, and Jeff Bayako. Reminder that all of our new episodes are on YouTube, and they come there first. So just search for Talk Through Media, and remember to subscribe and click the bell to get notified when we have new videos. Those videos in our production process go out first there before the episodes hit uh, our podcast feed. So that's the best way to get a chance to listen to us first. And if you're listening to us on the Star Trek Discovery podcast feed, you also get episodes of the Star Trek Picard cast and the Star Trek Lower Decks podcast. And it's worth saying that Everything that Talk Through Media does can be found on the Talk Through Media All Inclusive feed, which includes the three podcasts that I just mentioned, as well as the Rebinged DS9 podcast, the Walking Dead Talk Through, and Let's Talk Through. And Kyle and new host LT, <laughs> as we we talked about this, are doing Fear the Walking Dead Talk Through right now. I've been on all of the episodes, first one all of it, 
the last couple parts of it. Um, but we have uh, now released episodes for the first three episodes so far. And we're also talking a bit about World Beyond each week, but we had quite a bit to say about it this week. Our next episode of the Star Trek Discovery podcast is season three, episode four, titled Forget Me Not, is written by Alan McElroy and I should say Ampersand. These are all Ampersands. Alan McElroy and Chris Silvestri and Anthony Marinville. We don't know who's directed it, and we don't have a description, of course, but we see them go to, looks like they go to the Trill home world, and um, we see actually Burnham kind of get into a little shooting match, and we looks like we see um, Adira and Burnham in the Trill pools, so whatever, the symbiont pools. That's about all we know. And as far as next week's episode of The Ready Room has actors Anthony Rapp, who of course plays Paul Stamets, and Wilson Cruz, who of course plays Hugh Culber on with uh, Will Wheaton. So, and that's it. So until next time, I'm Brian. And I'm not Ruthie. And I'm LT. And I want to thank both you guys so much for filling in on such short notice this week. Uh, Ruthie should be back next week. And, uh, but thank you so much guys for, for filling in for her. peace and long life. Live, Live long, long and prosper. prosper.